So, try to keep everybody attentive. Um, I would like to start out uh, being 25 years in business, uh, examining Dipitron's patients, not only the hands but also the feet. And that's the conclusions from these 25 years. Um, I can get my thing done here. Okay, I hope it's the right direction. No, it's not the right direction. Don't start the clock now. Okay, I have a financial <laughs> disclosure. The only dependency I have is my family. And as you can see, I'm not meeting Charlie. It's only five children. And together we are seven. <clears throat> as it was phrased before, uh, there are many diseases which uh, turn around this fibroblast and myofibroblast. And radiation therapy has been proven to be effective in many other sites than just dipiturns and lederhose. And uh, Paul Worker already mentioned it's keloids. And one of the driving forces in this is inflammation and it's scarring, it's repair. And radiosensitive cells are lymphocytes. They react to very low doses of radiation and fibroblasts. They are proliferating cells like tumor cells. So radiation therapy is a very convenient method to interfere with fibroblast activity. As I show you the modern situation of keloid treatment, we have young women who want to get nicer breasts, with results that about 15% of them end up with ugly scars. And radiation therapy helps them to get nicer breasts. And it's a decision of having ugly breasts or having potentially low increased risk of cancer. And on the other hand, we have piercing coming up, and again, it's an increasing entity, and radiation therapy plays a decisive role to give surgery the ability to repair a situation which was not repaired before. However, as regard to dipitrans, it's important that we start radiation at a very early phase, and probably radiation is the only method you have right now to interfere in the early stage. And this is a misinter misinterpretation of radiation in textbooks like Brenner's. He's showing you ugly so-called radionecrosis. I have seen this picture. None of them is a radionecrosis. Patient might have been treated in the past, but radionecrosis uh, are situations where you have irradiated and then tissue necrotizes. This was tissue never healing after operation. And this may be due to a result of surgery, maybe interfering with radiation. So this is a complete misinterpretation of radiotherapy data, and there have been faults in the past with radiotherapy as well, which I will show you. It's clear that in the nodules, you have a high amount of fibroblast, and that's the key role, the nodule and the fibroblast. And as I want to mention, it's only this tissue, and it's this stage, when radiation is effective. If you treat in a situation where you have 30 and 40 degree angle, it's already scarred tissue. In this situation, radiation plays no role. And if radiation therapists give radiation to that stage, it's a mistake. The only stage amenable to radiotherapy is the phase when fibroblasts are proliferating. And one of the really nice proofs being shown was the group by Rodemann in Tübingen. And what they basically showed that the fibroblast and the myofibroblast have about 50 cycles in the lifetime of a human to uh, proliferate. And in, within a damaged system, these fibroblasts will continue to proliferate, become myofibroblasts, and in the end, if they come in the post-mitotic phase, they get the contracture. So by interfering with this change in differentiation, you will stop the process of proliferation, you will stop the nodule formation, you will stop the cord formation. So that means if you interfere in that circle, in this cascading process, early enough, with an agent which is able to interfere with proliferation, then that's the choice to go for early intervention. And here is just the summary of the slides. Non-irradiated tissue, as you see in the upper row, uh, is much less, uh, it's just the sham treatment. In the lower row, you see it's a dramatic change in the apoptotic rate in, in, the in the interference with differentiation. 
I don't tell you more details, it can be read up in the group of Rodemann. Just put it into Google so you see the wonderful papers he has published 10 years ago and 5 years ago. So the key question is, and as you see, you had the Tubiana classification just because you want to know stage 1 to stage 2. That's the sensitive phase where you go and give operation. Because this hand is in an advanced situation in terms of misfunctioning. For radiation therapy, it's important to give a little other staging system. Just think of 10 degree being the limit for radiation to be given. And then that's clear. Go for radiation therapy in the early phase when you have no extension deficit, when you just have the nodules and a beginning <coughs> extension deficit. That's the only stage when radiation should be given, no later. And that's the stole story. On the right side you see, on, on the lower part you see, that the disease evolves within months, years and decades. And on the ordinate you see the grades. And usually the whole society, the whole world waits until you have an extension deficit to 30 or 45 degrees. And then you go in. But the disease before that is already proliferating, it's going on. And what you usually give a recommendation to the patients, wait until you have an extension deficit and then I operate you. What an ugly advice. Why should patients wait when you have a target set amenable to treatment? And that's exactly what is what I want to respond in the end. Looking back into the literature, there had been several retrospective data, but no control on the inclusion criteria, no control on the dosage, and certainly indications at a later stage were not effective. And it was clear with the Erlangen study, which I participated from the early on 85, and examined patients and tried to methodize uh, the way of documenting disease. Uh, it was clear that with the more advanced stages, radiation would have much less effect. And that has been proven now with long-term analysis up to 15 years. So the indication in my point is, if a patient comes to me and presents with stipitrans, and he said, I have it for five years, and there's no change, he's not being treated. It's a dormant situation. I do all the examination, I follow him, I tell him, come back within six months or 12 months, and then we look for changes. And that's the important part, to detect the early stage when patients really proliferate and get clinical changes. If you see a beginning deficit, it's high time to do something. Poor surgical outcome on the contralateral hand and beginning disease on the other hand is a good sign to give radiation in an early stage. And it might be interesting to use radiation after we have a very early relapse, let's say within a month or two months you see nodes growing because fibroblasts are the driving force in the stage as well. So what we did in, at the University of uh, Essen, or at my former place, I've examined more than 600 patients over the last 14 years. 412 of these patients are now followed up for more than five years. And the data I'm presenting is for those patients with a minimum follow-up of five years. Patients decided themselves to receive radiation or being controlled. When they decide for radiation, they were randomized in a lower dose arm, B, 7 times 3 gray, or they get the traditional 10 times 3 gray, higher dose situation. On the photograph, you can see that usually we provide around the palpable changes, cords or nodes, a margin of 2 centimeter longitudinal and 1 centimeter lateral. That were our radiation portals. When we looked now, last follow-up examined at the end of 2009, extending follow-up 14 years longest, minimum five years, we could see in the control hands a progression rate of 61%. <coughs> progression was any additional nodule, any additional cord, any addi additional extension deficit. And those who required surgery within this period were 31%. Radiation therapy in the lower dose group had a progression of 23% and required surgery in 12%. And radiation was the higher dose, had a progression rate of 18% and required surgery in 7%. With this indication and with the selection of data, for my point, it's the proof that radiation is able in early stage disease to control and prevent progression and 
probably delay operation in the whole run, uh, whole the time. In multivariate analysis, we found that radiation versus control is highly significant. It's the highest odd, odds ratio which can be achieved. And the second run is stage of disease. So even the 10 degree or 20 degree is much less effective than the zero situation. And in addition, uh, smoking plays in univariate a role and also finger involvement plays a role. So it's a more extensive disease. So in summary for dipitrans, we would say control, probably three times better control with regard to surgery and probably 2.5 times better control with radiation with regard to any time of progression. <laughs> And this with very low acute toxicity and chronic toxicity. Chronic toxicity is a little bit dry skin. And I'm collaborating with a hand surgeon which is quite known to the German society. It is uh, uh, Kurt Steffens, who is working in Essen. He was trained by Professor Koop. And he told me with regard to potential side effects after operating an irradiated patient. He tells me, Heinrich, I have so many difficult cases to operate. Most of them have never received radiation. It's just a matter of having a difficult disease to be operated on. And he basically operates on all my cases. We have no healing problem at all because he's a very diligent and good surgeon to go with. The other question is, most hand surgeons never examine the feet. And the podiatrists never examine the hands. I have never seen literature doing the ratio in between. I can tell you from my data, 50% of all lederhose patients have Dibitrans disease. And about 20% of Dibitrans patients have lederhose disease. And I have all sorts of risk factors which you mentioned, like nicotine abuse, or have examined peyronies, or diabetes, or epileptic medication. It's all in the database and we can examine and look for that in the long run. So the question is, the plantar fascia is different, and interestingly enough, the disease is not on the fourth digit, it's on the first and the second, due to other mechanical forces, which had been shown before. What is the usual management on the foot? Local excision with a relapse rate of 85%. You don't see large sears in surgery of the foot because of these dismal results. Most of the patients require secondary and tertiary surgery ending up in subtotal excision and again even in this disease you have a 50% relapse rate. So the question is, having this complication rate, is there any successful treatment for Morbus Lederhos? Yes it is. We have seen 143 patients in exactly the same period and as you see it's about 20%, 25% of this population. Uh, 138 of them had more than one year follow-up. We had an equal distribution between male and female. There were uh, more of them bilateral. 22, 20, 222 feet were involved. 54 were uninvolved, so they were serving as control. And other patients were serving as control because they don't want to receive radiation. So we gave local radiotherapy, not randomized, because it's a, a first evaluation study. That was the schedule, five times three gray, a break. <coughs> After eight to 12 weeks, another schedule of five times three gray, because it's a slow progressing disease, and you have to add slow times when you give radiation. That's the treatment, very simple. The cost of this treatment with auto voltage is about 300 euro in Germany, if you use it with linear accelerators, it's about 600 euros. So it's one-tenth of the cost you have with any type of surgery plus recurrent surgery. So it's easy to apply. You have all so in any country you have radiation therapy facilities available. What was the toxicity? We got grade 1 toxicity in 21%. And the clinical response, chronic, was the same, dry skin, nothing else, no ulcer. No uh, carcinogenesis at that time, because there is poor carcinogenesis, very, very low figures in the hand at all. You may expose your hands for a whole daily lifetime uh, in sunlight, and you won't really get high numbers of basal cell carcinoma. They occur in different. So the hand is very endurable versus cancer risk. Clinical response was in only 11% had progressed after treatment. While, while the control group had 34% progress, so three times more progress. 
we got objective remission, that means nodule reduction, cord reduction, in about 50% of the patients. And we got symptomatic relief in more than two-thirds of the patient. Itching, tension sensation, pressure sensation, and also reduction of pain. People could walk again normally when they had pain before. So combination with morbus dupiter, as I showed you, very high, about 50%. Salvage surgery after radio survey was possible. There was about 85% of patients stating that they had a better quality of life after radiation. That was one year evaluation. And what I wanted to point out, radiation is effective, reduces the necessity of surgery. We have long-term data, and I know from the surgical series, there are not very studies around, with minimum follow-up data of five years. So the future, in my point, is to study the lowest dose which is achievable for certain subtypes of dipitrans. And it's also interesting to look into this final slide. You remember, this is the traditional pathway of treating. You await a situation when you need surgery to improve function, and you know you don't cure the disease. You just want to preserve function. So why not preserve function at a much earlier stage with a situation where you really have a target cell? and when you can interfere with the target cell mechanism. And that's this situation. You may slow down progression, and even that will delay operation. That's for the 20%. You may be stabilizing the disease. You will never require surgery. And for later hose, at least, we have 50% You reduce the situation. And I think this study should serve as a final statement to have a control study available that all over the world we should start this setting together as hand surgeon as a radiation therapist and try to set up a very diligent way to document the disease on both sides. Thank you very much.